Just want to make sure that we are still all doing really well with that. You know, uh, we have got a lot of folks out there that seem to have a misunderstanding about what it is that moves us to be obedient to Christ. A lot of folks seem to think that the reason we do what we do is to avoid punishment because we don't want to go to hell. And that's why we follow God's word. Well, <clears throat> that's not how that works. In fact, I'm not aware of any Christian. I don't know that I've ever met a Christian who is motivated to obey God because they're trying to avoid punishment. <clears throat> now, that will work in some social circumstances, I guess. That's why we have negative behavior reinforcement. You know, that's why at schools they have in-school suspension and things like that, trying to give you unpleasant consequences for your actions as a deterrent to those actions that are not desired. But that's not what God promises us, and that's not what causes us to follow him. While that sort of thing might work okay in a totalitarian regime, where people fear the consequences of their actions, God does not call us to that, nor does he call us like that. In fact, our response to God as we move toward his will, as we continue to grow in obedience, is a process. It's not just a single thing. And so it's more complicated than you know, looking at behavioral sciences with uh, animals. It's not a matter of reward or punishments. It's far more complex than that. We see this at work in Jesus' interaction with his disciples, beginning in John 13. In John 13, the scene shifts in John's narrative. For at this point, Jesus is gathered with his disciples for a Passover feast. And he begins to teach them and explain to them what is going to happen. He is on his way that very night to the Garden of Gethsemane, where even though he pours out his heart in prayer, asking for God to take away the things that he is about to suffer, he will be arrested, he will be tried twice, and he will be brought before Pilate the next day, and then crucified. He knows this. And he begins to teach his disciples some of the very important things, his last words that he wants to leave with them before he faces his death. So John 13 begins. <clears throat> now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end during supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do not wash my feet. Jesus answered him, What I am doing that you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash your feet, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. 
For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done to you. As Jesus spends these last hours with his disciples prior to his death, he attempts to teach them some things about their relationships to one another and their relationship to him. Ultimately, he's moving them into those words that he says in the last couple of verses of that passage, 13 through 15. But he moves them there gradually. He doesn't just tell them, this is what you need to do. But he takes them through a process. And it's a process that begins with love. Notice what John says in the very first verse of chapter 13. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And this is one of the most important bits of information that we have as John makes this transition in his narrative. Because from here on out, John wants to make it absolutely clear that everything Jesus does is motivated by his love for his followers. None of this is self-serving. None of this is designed to draw attention to self, but to show, to demonstrate and through his sacrifice to save in love his followers. It's all about his love. He loved them to the end. You know, when someone first responds to Christ, typically that response is based upon their understanding of Christ's love for them. You think about it. What was it that caused you to desire to be his child? What was it that moved you to want to be part of his family, to want to be baptized into his church? Was it not the understanding that Jesus had done so much for me out of love? This is, this is the least that I could do. Many of us, when we are shown love and we feel that we don't deserve it, we respond in kind. We respond by considering how we might be able to repay that sense of worth we were given when we felt ourselves unworthy, though nothing can repay Christ for his sacrifice. Paul tells us in Romans 5.8, that God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not while we were good people. Not while we had all, all everything together. While we were spiritually minded. But when we were lost and unworthy, Christ died for us. When he hung on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing when he gave up himself for the very people who didn't care and were putting him to death, when he extended that much mercy and grace, that's real love. And oftentimes, as people newly uh, moved by the gospel of Christ, this is what pushes us at first. This is what compels us. We understand how much we are loved and we want to respond in kind. Paul would write to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.15, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. He came to save sinners, not righteous people. 
Not people who consider themselves to have it all together spiritually. People who think they've got all the answers. He came to save the people whose lives are in a mess. He came to save the murderers and thieves. He came to save the harlots and the tax collectors. He came to save the self-righteous, those who put their faith in money and things. He came to save the complacent, the apathetic, the people who don't show love and kindness toward their brothers and sisters, toward other human beings. He came to save those people. And maybe somewhere on the spectrum of all the people that fall into the category of sinners, you can find yourself before Jesus took hold of you. That's who he came to save. So Jesus begins with love. He will end with love as well. But this is oftentimes where we start moving into obedience. We understand that Jesus wants to save us. We understand that he's called us to be baptized into him, to put him on. And so we take that step. And our journey into obedience begins. But as we mature, oftentimes that initial sense of love and gratitude begins to fade. That initial phase we can think of as the romance phase. It's pretty typical, even among human beings. When you meet that person that kind of leaves you starstruck and you think, wow, this is a great person. I want to spend time with this person. But after you spend time with them, that sense kind of goes away. It's not that you don't want to spend time with them. It's not that you stop loving them. But that initial romance phase is kind of gone. Things feel different. Things feel comfortable. And so that in itself is not enough to just motivate us to continue to grow in Christ. But one of the things we quickly come to do after becoming Christians is we come to trust his vision. It's not enough just to respond because Jesus saves and he wants to save, but we learn to trust that he really, really can save. That everything he does, everything that he brings in our lives is for our own benefit. It's for our own growth. It's for the growth of his church. And we come to trust in his vision. Jesus wanted his disciples to see through his eyes. He wanted them to capture his vision. John tells us in verse 3 that Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God, was going back to God. This is the context. This is the vision. Jesus saw the big picture. Now, we often don't do that. With our limited human minds, we find ourselves unable to take in the big picture. But we trust the Lord because that's exactly where he's leading us. He sees all of history from beginning to end. He knows what will help us, what will bring us into better relationship with him and with one another. And we trust him. And because we trust him, we begin to obey him more fully for perhaps deeper reasons than that initial sense of awe and wonder that he would love a sinner like me. In the very next chapter, in John in chapter 14, John will write at the beginning of that chapter, Jesus' words to them, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. 
Jesus sees the end of all things, and we can't. We can't see what the ripple effects will be, that what the consequences, the grander consequences will be of a particular action that we take or a particular inaction. We can't see where this path that we find ourselves on today is going to lead us. But as we come to trust the Lord and his vision, we follow. Even when we can't see. Even when the way ahead is shrouded in darkness to our own eyes, we know that there is nothing dark to him and we follow. As we continue to grow in our relationship with him, though, we find ourselves interacting with him in more and more intimate ways. We spend time in his word and we allow him to speak to us through what we read and what we learn from the wisdom of other godly people around us. We see Jesus at work in our brothers and sisters in the congregation. We spend time with one another and we learn to interact with Jesus as we interact with our friends and family in the church. You know, Jesus was a person who touched. This is something that right now in this time of a pandemic, many of us are missing. The inability to shake hands with someone you care about, much less give them a hug. You know, sometimes that's rough. And there are a lot of people who are feeling the lack of physical contact and it hurts. We long for touch, and Jesus was one of those who touched. But Jesus not only touched people, his was a servant's touch. In verse 5, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around them. It wasn't enough that he just went and rested a hand on a shoulder like a father might do to a child or a teacher to a student. He got down on his knees and he washed their dusty, dirty feet. The menial task of a servant. Not one of his disciples offered to do that as they reclined together at table. But the master left the head place and began to wash their feet. The significant thing here is that when Jesus touched others, it was the touch of a servant. He did not seek his own gratification, but he sought the best for others. Matthew chapter 8 tells us, about a leper who came to Jesus and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. That was a no-no. Not only was there fear that you might get this skin disease from someone else, but it was forbidden in Jewish law. If you contacted a leper, this made you unclean. Yet Jesus touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. It's so hard for us sometimes to reach out a loving servant's hand to an individual who we look at and we see the leprosy of sin clinging to them. We see the dirty dusty road on their feet. And we don't want to touch that. And yet that's what the Savior did. And that's what he did for his disciples in an effort for them to understand that the touch of the master was the touch of a servant. That it is integral to our growth as a Christian, to our growth as his disciples. We want that contact with our own God, but then we're called upon to share that contact with others. Now, maybe like Peter, we might respond in the negative at first. 
verses 6 through 9, he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Now, Peter wasn't thinking about the spiritual ramifications of what Jesus was doing. Peter was thinking that here is the master, I'm the lowly disciple. Maybe he was even feeling a little ashamed that he himself <clears throat> had not volunteered to wash Jesus' feet. But in any case, this galled him to think that his master would lower himself to take on this menial servant's task and wash his feet. Perhaps he was also appalled that the other disciples had allowed him to do this and not protested. So Peter, recognizing Jesus' position and his own, immediately understands this isn't right. The master doesn't wash the disciples' feet. And so he said, you're not going to wash my feet. But Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Look at Peter's response to that. He's all or nothing. As soon as Jesus says that, and he understands Jesus' desire for him, he says, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And shoulders, knees and toes. No, he didn't say that. <coughs> but he wanted basically to be all in. Now, how many of us respond like Peter does? As our faith matures, as our desire for a relationship with God matures, we come to a point where he tells us something and we think, oh yes, that's me. I want to be a part of that because I am all in. Maybe like Peter, that's a somewhat, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> need some water, but that's okay. Maybe like Peter, that is a somewhat impetuous response. Nevertheless, as we grow in our relationship with Christ, obedience sometimes comes from our sudden understanding that Jesus desires us. He desires us to fulfill a role in his kingdom. And we think, oh, I can do that. Finally, however, as we begin to fully mature in Christ, we come to understand that what we really need is not just throwing ourselves with abandon into every single project that comes up in the church, every single ministry that we have. There's nothing wrong with helping where you can. But even that can be somewhat superficial until we completely and wholly commit. When our desire is God's desire, when our will is his will, when we want to do these things, when our obedience comes from the fact that this is what we want, we obey Christ to take the gospel to the world, not because he says to do it, <coughs> but because we want to take the gospel to the world. We want to see the change that he has told us we can have. We want to help the poor, not because he tells us to help the poor, but because we have a heart that hurts for them. We want to pray for the sick, not because we are commanded to do that, but because we are genuinely concerned for their health. Our eyes become Jesus' eyes. <coughs> and our heart becomes his heart. Thank you. I can usually make it longer than that. We become committed. Those last three verses of the passage we read, <coughs> 12 through 15. When he had washed their feet, 
and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? Now, in one sense, they did. They saw the master lower himself to wash their feet. But then he points out the significance of that. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, <clears throat> you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. That's the end goal. That's what we are growing toward. That point when our obedience isn't because God said do something. It's because we have God's heart in ours. It's because we have Jesus' concern in us. It's because the Spirit has filled us with a righteous anger against sin and its effects on people and on the world. And we do these things because we want for the world what God wants. We want for our church family what God wants. Obedience is not about trying to avoid punishment or even just trying to get reward. I mean, yes, every one of us wants to go to heaven. And I sure hope to see everybody here, there before too long. I'm not in a rush. Not for y'all either. But that's not what motivates us to be obedient. Maybe at first, maybe when we're young Christians, that helps. But there comes a point in time when we have to desire what God desires. When we have to grow to the point that his will is ours. When we can begin to picture a world and a church and a family that is the world and the church and the family that he wants. And we will move heaven and earth to make his vision reality. That's why we obey. The eyes of the Father the heart of the Son, the passion of the Spirit. Those are ours, our eyes, our heart, our passion. And that's why we obey. So don't write Christians off as people who simply obey because they don't want to be punished. Don't write them off as people who simply obey because they expect to get some kind of a reward. It's more complicated than that. We obey because we are God's, we are his children, we are his people, and we want what he wants. I imagine most of you here this morning, if you're not there yet, you're working there. We're all working to become more mature in Christ. We're getting there. And one day, if we stand by one another and if we continue to pray for and support one another, we're going to get there where our desires are God's desires. And that's going to motivate everything we do to bring glory and honor to him in this community and in this church. But until we get there, let's continue to be there for one another. Let's continue to help one another to love to trust, to grow, to touch, until we get to the point where we don't even have to be told what to do. We do it because that's what God wants, and that's what we want. If you have a need this morning that you want to share with your brothers and sisters here at Westside, we're going to sing a song. All to Jesus I surrender. Think of those words, all to him I freely give.
I will ever love and trust him in his presence, daily live. We're going to sing that song, and if there is a need that you have that you want to share with us, feel free to do that. If you're joining with us online, you want to share with us a desire for prayer or some other need that you have, feel free to email here at the office or call or call someone or text someone that you love, that you trust. And let us be in prayer for you and let us serve you. Whatever need you have, if you would share that with us while we stand and sing. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ourselves to you this day. As a congregation, we empty ourselves and we give our church to you this day. And it is our prayer that you use us. We are your instruments, your tools. We are at your disposal. Use us, Lord. Bring glory and honor to your name through us. Bring comfort and peace to the hurting through us. Bring love and mercy and kindness to the lost through us. Lord, we give this day to you as well. We pray that everything that we do today will bring honor to you. Help us always to watch the things that we say, the actions, the attitudes that we display for the world so that everything we do may be seasoned, every word precious gold in a setting of silver. Lord, we ask your blessing upon us as your church. Bless us as we leave here. Bless us as we work among those that we will see day to day in this world. Bless us as we return, Lord. Give us strength and peace. And always help us to ever grow our faith in you and your vision. It's in the name of Jesus we pray.